Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This video is about the Taylor series of the Lambert W function about zero. The expansion can be obtained using the Lagrange inversion theorem. But here I will adopt a more basic approach. U is W0 of Z. This means that U times E to the power U is equal to Z. When Z is equal to zero, U is equal to zero. Our interest is a series expansion for U of Z. Because U of zero is equal to zero, we have a summation starting from one. U of Z is summation N from one to infinity, A N Z to the power N. A N is equal to zero when N is non-positive. The goal is to obtain A N. Z is equal to U times E to the power U. Differentiate both sides with respect to Z. We get one on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we differentiate with respect to U to get E to the U plus U E to the U. And then by the chain rule, we will have the derivative of U with respect to Z. The right-hand side is E to the U, the first derivative of U with respect to Z times one plus U. Multiply both sides by U. So U is equal to one plus U, U E to the U, and this is Z times the first derivative. We have u equal to u plus 1, z u prime. This is equal to u z u prime plus z u prime. Move this term to the left-hand side. u is this summation, n from 1 to infinity, a n z to the power n. If we differentiate u, we get summation, n from 1 to infinity, a n, n z to the power n minus 1. If the first derivative is multiplied by z, then the power here is n. This term is summation n from 1 to infinity n a n times z to the power n. On the right-hand side, we have the product of u and z u prime. So we need to multiply these two series. We have a double sum, summation k from 1 to infinity, m from 1 to infinity, then a m z to the power m, k a k z to the power k. The next step is to equate the coefficients of z to the power n on both sides. Let's assume that n is greater than or equal to 2. On the left-hand side, the coefficient of z to the power n is a n minus n a n. That's a n times 1 minus n. On the right-hand side, we have a double sum. And if we combine these two terms, we get z to the k plus m. We are interested in the coefficient of z to the power n. This is summation k from 1 to infinity, summation m from 1 to infinity, a m k a k, such that k plus m is equal to n. Because of this constraint, given k, m is equal to n minus k. The coefficient of z to the power n on the right-hand side is summation k from 1 to infinity, k, a, k, a, n minus k. Note that a, m is equal to 0 if m is less than or equal to 0. a, n minus k is equal to 0 if n minus k is less than or equal to 0, which means that k is greater than or equal to n. If k is equal to n or more, this term here is equal to 0. We can stop the sum at n minus 1. We have the summation here. And because we are assuming that n is not equal to 1, we can divide both sides by 1 minus n. What we currently have is that the coefficient a n is equal to 1 over 1 minus n. Then this summation here, I will write it with index j. Let's do a change of summation index j equal to n minus k. When j is equal to n minus 1, k is equal to 1. When j is equal to 1, k is equal to n minus 1. This j becomes n minus k. A j is a n minus k and a n minus g is a k. a n is 1 over 1 minus n times this sum, which can also be written in this way. The trick here is to add these two expressions. We have 2 a n equal to 1 over 1 minus n. Then we add the summons. These two terms are common, a k, a n minus k. From here we have k. From there we have n minus k. Their sum is equal to n, which can be taken outside the summation. A n is equal to n over 2 times 1 minus n. This 2 is that 2. Then we have a sum k from 1 to n minus 1, a k a n minus k. And this expression is for every n that is greater than or equal to 2. What about a 1? a 1 can be obtained using the derivative. Note that u of z is equal to a 1 z plus a 2 z squared plus a 3 z cubed and so on. Differentiating term by term, something we can do for any power series in the interior of its region of convergence. The first derivative of u is a1 plus 2a2z plus 3a3z squared and so forth. We can obtain a1 using the value of the first derivative at z equal to 0. If z is equal to 0, all these terms vanish and we are left with a1. So we have this expression here. If we put u equals 0, we get 1 equal to 1 plus 0, that's 1. e to the power 0, that's 1. Then the first derivative evaluated at 0 is equal to 1. a1 is equal to 1. In addition to this expression, we have that a1 is equal to 1. If a1 is equal to 1, what is a2? a2 is equal to 2 over 2 times 1 minus 2. And then what about the summation? 
if n is equal to 2, the sum has one term with k equal to 1. It is a1 times a2 minus 1, that's a1 again. So it is a1 squared, which is 1. And the outside factor is minus 1, so a2 is equal to minus 1. We have now a1 and a2. We can use them to obtain a3. a3 is equal to 3 over 2 times 1 minus 3. We have two terms here, k equal to 1 and k equal to 2. When k is 1, we have a1 times a2. When k is 2, we get a2, a1. We know a1 and a2. We can compute a3, and it is 3 over 2. We can continue and obtain more coefficients. Is there a pattern? Perhaps the coefficients are something divided by n factorial. Let's multiply each coefficient by the factorial of n. a n times n factorial is equal to 1, minus 2, 9, then minus 64, 625, and so forth. Those numbers seem to follow a pattern. First, they are alternating in sign. We can just put minus 1 to the power n minus 1, so that when n is odd, we have a positive coefficient. When n is even, we get a negative coefficient. Then we have 1, 2, 9, 64, 625. This is like 2 to the 1, 9 is 3 to the 2, 64 is 4 to the 3, 625 is 5 to the 4. A reasonable guess is that this sequence here is minus 1 to the power n minus 1 times n to the power n minus 1. And if this is true, then a n is equal to this quantity here divided by the factorial of n. We can check more coefficients and discover that indeed all of them follow this rule here. To rigorously show that a n is minus n to the power n minus 1 over n factorial, we can use induction. The cases with small n are already established. So to complete the proof by induction, we need to show that if we assume that a k is minus k to the k minus 1 over k factorial, for every k in this set of positive integers from 1 to n minus 1, then a n is minus n to the n minus 1 over n factorial. We are using strong induction. a n has this expression. Note that the coefficients that are involved in the sum, they are a k and k is from 1 to n minus 1, and a n minus k and n minus k is also in this set here we can employ our induction assumption. a k is minus k to the k minus 1 over k factorial. a n minus k is minus between brackets n minus k to the power n minus k minus 1. Then we divide by the factorial of n minus k. To finish off our derivation, we need to show that this quantity here is equal to this one. These two guys multiplied together yield minus 1 power n minus 1 minus 2. That's minus 1 power n. Let's take this outside n and bring it inside the sum. n is equal to k plus n minus k. We have k factorial and n minus k factorial downstairs. We can multiply and divide by n factorial to get the binomial coefficient n choose k inside the sum. Let's split this sum into two sums. In one of them, we take k. In the other sum, we take n minus k. In the first sum, we will have k to the power k, then n minus k to the power n minus k minus 1. In the second sum, we have k to the k minus 1, n minus k to the power n minus k. In this summation here, we can replace k by n minus k. Or if we do it in slow motion, let's rewrite the sum as j from 1 to n minus 1, and choose j, j to the j, n minus j, to the n minus j minus 1. Let's do a change of summation index, j equal to n minus k. When j is n minus 1, k is 1. When j is 1, k is n minus 1. n choose j becomes n choose n minus k. But n choose n minus k is exactly n choose k n minus g to the n minus g minus 1 becomes k to the k minus 1, and g to the g becomes n minus k to the n minus k. This sum is exactly equal to that sum. We can just keep one of them and multiply by 2. When we do so, this one half is eliminated. Minus 1 to the power n divided by 1 minus n can be written as minus 1 to the n minus 1 over n minus 1. Then we have 1 over n factorial, and this is our summation. It can be shown that this summation is equal to n to the power n minus n to the power n minus 1. Take n to the power n minus 1 as a common factor. We are left with n minus 1. These two guys go away, and we are left with minus n all to the power n minus 1 over n factorial as desired. Indeed, for every positive integer n, a n is equal to minus n to the n minus 1 over n factorial. The Taylor series of w0 of x about 0 a summation n from 1 to infinity minus n to the n minus 1 over n factorial x to the power n. What is the radius of convergence? We can apply the root test. The radius of convergence is 1 over 
limit supremum, n tends to infinity, the magnitude of a n, that's n to the n minus 1 over n factorial to the power 1 over n. So the radius of convergence is the limit as n tends to infinity of n factorial divided by n to the n minus 1, all to the power 1 over n. Asymptotically, n factorial can be written as square root 2 pi n to the half n to the n e to the minus n. These are divided by n to the n minus 1 all to the power 1 over n. This limit here is e to the minus 1. Let's use our series to solve this famous integral. We have integration from 0 to 1, x to the x to the power x to the x to the power x to the x and so on. So it's an infinite power tower. The first order of business is to represent the integrand in terms of the w function. If the integrand is equal to y and we assume convergence, then y is equal to x to the x to the power y. Thus, y is equal to x to the power xy or e to the power yx len x. We want to solve for y, multiply both sides by e to the minus yx len x, then multiply both sides by minus x len x. What we have here is something e to the power of the same thing equal to minus x len x. So what we have here, which is minus yx len x, by definition is equal to w0 of minus x len x. Dividing both sides by minus x len x, we get y. Our integrand is this function of x. Let's think a bit about this function. The argument here is minus x len x. We also have it in the denominator. If we define the function g of x to be minus x len x, the first derivative is minus len x minus x over x, that's minus 1. The first derivative is equal to 0 when x is equal to e to the minus 1. If we differentiate again, the second derivative is minus 1 over x. The second derivative is strictly negative for positive x. This function is concave. The first derivative is 0 at e to the minus 1. The first derivative is positive if x is less than e to the minus 1, negative if x is greater than e to the minus 1. We indeed have a local maximum at e to the minus 1. What is the maximum value of minus x ln x? It is minus e to the minus 1, ln e to the minus 1. That's e to the minus 1. If x is in the open interval between 0 and 1, minus x ln x, this function g of x, is positive and it has a local maximum at e to the minus 1 and the maximum value is e to the minus 1. On the previous page, we obtained a Taylor series expansion for this function and the radius of convergence was e to the minus 1. We are justified in using this Taylor series expansion. For every point in the open interval between 0 and 1, minus x ln x is strictly less than e to the minus 1 except at just one point. We can then do the integration term by term Let's do a change of variables, t equal to minus ln x. So x is e to the minus t, dx is minus e to the minus t dt. When x tends to 0 from above, t tends to plus infinity. When x tends to 1 from below, t tends to 0. The integration becomes from infinity to 0, but we can use this minus sign here to get it from 0 to infinity. And here is e to the minus t dt. What about this part here? Minus ln x is t, and x itself is e to the minus t. Integrand is t to the n minus 1 times e to the minus nt. We can do another substitution. u is equal to nt. The integral is from 0 to infinity. t to the n minus 1 becomes u to the n minus 1 over n to the n minus 1. This becomes e to the minus u. dt is du over n. This integral here with those guys is gamma of n divided by n to the power n. And gamma n is the factorial of n minus 1. n minus 1 factorial divided by n factorial will give us n downstairs. Then we have n to the n minus 1, and in the denominator we have n to the n, we have another n downstairs. Our sum is n from 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the n minus 1, and then we have n squared in the denominator. This summation here is the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of the positive integers, but we have alternating signs. We need to subtract double the even index terms. From this bracket, we can take 1 fourth as a common factor. This is zeta of 2. The outside factor here is 2 over 4, that's 1 half. And when we take a common factor, this bracket will be 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on. That's also zeta of 2. Epsi, which is our integral, is 1 half of zeta of 2. That's by squared over 12. We obtained the value of this integral here by applying the series expansion of the Lambert W function. 